So, welcome back, everybody. Uh, and my name is Mark Gabe. For those of you that missed the beginning and don't know who I am, and I'd like to introduce the team. Um, so, my name is Mark Gabe. As I said, I'm the director of the ARC and the theme lead for this theme. Dr. Clarissa Giebel is our senior research fellow. Dorcas Arkeju and Paul Moran are our public advisor co leads. And uh, Pallavi Deshpande uh, is our theme manager, without whom we wouldn't be able to function. So many thanks, Pallavi. I know you've done a lot of work to be able to get this theme meeting working as smoothly as I hope it will today. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to quickly run us through what we're going to be doing in today's theme meeting. Uh, Pallavi is going to introduce us to some statistics and summaries of where we're up to so far. Uh, and then I'm going to do a brief talk about uh, our Seaside um, Research Development Network and our Social Prescribing Research Development Network that we've set up. These are both uh, regional and national. Uh, and then Clarissa and I are going to talk about our research sub-themes as in uh, the life course theme. Uh, then Dorcas and Paul are going to present us with a co-leads update. And then Susanna is going to do a, a presentation on her PhD. Then colleagues Kim, Rachel and Rosemarie are going to talk about social care. And then we're going to have a, a project proposal from uh, another GP, Joe Rylands, uh, and also Pooja uh, Saini, who's a, an academic in, in John Moores in uh, psychology, looking particularly at suicide and mental health. And uh, they'll be presenting proposals. Then we'll be doing some voting, which informs our both our theme prioritization of proposals to us as Pallavi was talking about, uh, sorry, not Pallavi, as Shema was talking about earlier this morning uh, about how the, uh, the, uh, we introduce potential projects to the ARC. So we prioritise in the theme and then that prioritisation passes through to all the members. And those of you who are members on this uh, meeting just now, please do remember uh, to uh, vote your preferences and alert us to any projects you're interested in participating in when that uh, poll comes round in a few weeks' time uh, on Survey Monkey, and then finally we'll have time at the end for a just general discussion and any final comments or questions from yourselves. So that's my section done, and over to Pallavi to hear about what we've been up to. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Pallavi Deshpande and I'm the manager for the health and care across the life course theme. Today I'm going to be giving you a little bit of an overview of the progress within the theme. Since the ARC started in 2019, the HACAL theme have been quite busy. We have a substantial portfolio of about 56 projects and these include Clark follow-up projects, PhDs, internships, newly prioritized projects, projects in the outline stage, as well as external grants. With respect to external grant applications, we've put 24 projects forward, out of which 14 of these have been successful. 10 are in preparation and three projects have now been completed. It's also important to note that some of these successful grants are part of international collaboration, which is a large part of our um, theme activities. With respect to publications, we have about 34 articles published now, and more than 15 articles have been submitted or are in preparation. So again, since 2019, the HACAL theme has engaged with about 36 member organizations. It's also important to mention that some of these organizations are third sector organizations and they're non-members and these non-members also have contributed largely to um, the theme and as you know the ARC works really closely with the public and the uh, theme has worked really closely with about 23 different public advisors uh, since uh, the ARC started. Thank you.
Uh, ah. Mark, yes, I'm here. Uh, sorry, I just said you to unmute. Hi, uh, Pallavi, thank you very much for that. I um, hope you realise, uh, colleagues, that we really have been very busy in the interim. As you can see, lots of work going on, lots of engagement, uh, lots of publications coming out from our work and uh, tribute to the hard work of uh, the core team and, of course, all our members and public advisors who've been working along with us. So now I'm going to talk a bit about what we call research development networks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have two research development networks, both hosted in uh, the uh, life course theme. And uh, those of you who've been attending these theme meetings beforehand will be familiar with both of these projects. Um, and this is what they've morphed into. Um, so uh, our Seaside Town and Communities Research Development Network and our Social Prescribing Research Development Networks are now regularly meeting and are extending beyond the arc itself. So next slide, please. So let me explain what they are. Uh, first of all, uh, who are the members? So these uh, research development networks um, extend beyond the arc itself, and they're open to other providers, commissioners, members of the public, organizations with an interest in that area of work across uh, our region. So they draw together a variety of academics, uh, public and private sector organizations, uh, members of the public, uh, which may include also patients and uh, carers, uh, service users, uh, commissioners who commission uh, health and social care, uh, and professionals from inside the ARC member organizations as well as others in the Northwest Coast. So what are these research development networks? Well, we, I'd like to describe them as spaces, virtual spaces at the moment, but with time they'll maybe be able to come back to face-to-face -to -face meetings as well, where we come together to share ideas, uh, what we're doing, what's working well, what we're struggling with, what our questions are, what our priorities might be to, to, uh, to overcome some of the challenges of living in a seaside town and community, because our focus there is particularly on uh, equity, health inequalities and health and well-being. And in social prescribing, uh, we're talking about, because um, I should have said social prescribing, and apologies if I said social care, I do tend to get the two mixed up, but it's about social prescribing. And social prescribing, for those of you who aren't familiar with this term, is where people have healthcare challenges, whether that's to change their lifestyle or improve their management of a chronic condition, or help on their recovery pathway from mental health challenges. These social prescribing opportunities are alternatives to medication, but they have hopefully the same sort of impact on people's life and recovery. And they may involve meetings, they may involve uh, some sort of therapeutic support, uh, sort of uh, mindfulness or walks in, the, in, in open space coming together with other people, with sharing those conditions, a whole variety of different things that people can do through social prescribing. And so we want to look at how that's developing and different models for signposting that. So the, the common one at the moment is that your GP, if you go to your GP with a problem, will send you to meet uh, their social prescribing link worker who will talk to you about problems that you may be having as an individual and then suggest what options there might be for a social prescribing opportunity to join in with and how to look at the motivation to keep that impetus up, having made a decision to join one of those groups to keep it going. So we want to look at that and what the common purpose is across the ARC members and other colleagues. And the idea, of course, as with a lot of artwork, is to co-develop external grant proposals to undertake uh, high quality research into these questions. So when do we meet? We meet every four to six weeks, usually for 60 to 90 minutes. And next slide, please, Pallavi. And let me tell you a bit about the progress. So the Seaside Town to Communities Group has been meeting, well, for over a year now, really, and before it morphed into uh, a research development network. Um, and over many discussions, we've been looking at what sort of innovations have been happening across the different uh, organizations that have been meeting in the different areas. And we've come up with four sort of sub themes. Um, there's quite a lot of work around beach schools. It may be a, a surprise to know that uh, children living within a mile of the coast have never actually visited the coast itself or been on the beach. So beach schools have been developed by um, 
primary schools, secondary schools and other organisations to help introduce young people uh, onto uh, the opportunities for learning and leisure uh, and um, exercise, etc. at the beach, at the coast. Uh, and we're also introducing intergenerational elements so that older people can meet with younger people and talk about how they used to use that space when they were at their age. Um, we're also looking at community mental health as a topic uh, in the post-COVID world, looking at how we can help communities recover from the pandemic and deal with the mental health um, consequences of the pandemic and looking beyond. Obviously, another huge uh, priority for these coastal areas is economic regeneration. And the focus of that originally is working on the high streets, not least because there was some recent government funding in some of our areas to boost the high street investment. And then there's another issue. We have some of these coastal communities are very stable with people who've been there a long time and others, for example, Blackpool, lots of people come in and out of an area. And there seems to be in both of those situations, though, uh, a need to boost a sense of belonging to communities, particularly to incomers who maybe feel very transient and, and a bit locked out of what's happening around them. So looking at ways that we can sustain volunteering that's grown up through the pandemic and give people who live in, a, in one of these coastal seaside areas a sense of belonging and empowerment to, to partici participate in these sorts of things. So we've also been meeting, meeting across the different arcs in England that have coastal areas and there's about six actively engaged and we help set those meetings up and we're looking at potential um, grant applications for the healthy aging call that's come through we've been looking at setting up a research center with the economic um, and sociology research council uh, we're also looking at an nhr public health grant that's going in uh, later on this week uh, which has been developed in kent and the southeast and we're also looking at a variety of uh, program um, nhr program grant collaborations that we can grow from that and uh, as I've said, social prescribing has been a program in HACAL since, which is the Health and Care Across the Life course theme, which you're in now, since 2019. And these networks are drawing together existing programs across the different themes. So nearly all of the themes in our arc are looking at social prescribing in one way or another. So we've helped bring that together. And we've been looking at some of the projects that we already have that have been funded. We're doing a systematic review. Uh, equitable place-based health and care theme has got a big demonstration site project on social prescribing and we're also developing work that we initiated when we were a clerk in, in this space as well and that's got some uh, local CCG funding to develop some uh, a network uh, which has grown into this and we're also doing some work across the arcs again uh, looking at social prescribing and there's a big bid being developed to look at these link workers and I think that was my last slide Pallavi we can now move on so hopefully that's been a good introduction to what we're doing in these networks and please do join um the timings will be on the website of when the meetings are so clarissa hopefully is uh with us for this and i'll let her lead on this and i'll join in as and when We're going to talk about our sub themes. I am. Hi, Mark. Um, I just have a slight issue in that my um, screen seems to be half frozen. So, the yes. address is people. I'm the research fellow in the HCAL theme. And um, yeah. So, um, Pallavi, if you could click the next slide. Unless it's frozen and it's no, already no, it's there. Right. Initially, you're really struggling technically in this session for some reason. Initially, your voice had broken up, but it's back ah. on again now. Okay. It might help to turn off your video. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, doing that now. Does that help? Uh, there we go. So, hopefully, that will work a little bit better. So, um, we. Yeah, so we thought uh, since the last time we've had our theme meeting, we thought it'd be nice to really create some subgroups and subcategories for all the work that's ongoing in our theme. And 
given that we're looking at research across the life course, we thought it'd be sensible to cluster them according to kind of, well, groups, uh, age groups, basically. Um, so Cal from our comms department has done a really lovely job in creating some graphics for this, some um, to understand. So we've created six subcategories in which our work is divided into. So we've got family and children, we've got adolescents, working age adults, older adults, cross-generational and marginalized groups. And over the next couple of slides, we're just going to share some of the work that is going on in those different categories. And just to make you aware as well, there is in some of those categories, there's more work going on than in others. But it just means we are obviously interested in conducting research in all of those six categories. So Pallavi, if you could move to the next slide, thank you. Um, so under family and children, We've got um, national priorities on children, young people's mental health and children's health and maternity program and the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of community perinatal mental health services. Um, next slide, please. So then we have, as you can see, we've put two of those subgroups into one slide just because we don't have that much research at this stage going on yet. Um, so under adolescents, we've got adolescent mental health in the community and under working age adults, we have wor a work and health program. Um, so yes, so we do welcome um, ideas for these as well. Um, if you as a member or public advisor have some thoughts on them. Uh, next slide, please. And now you see um, a very full slide indeed. And a lot of these um, research projects I'm involved with in the older adult section. Um, so we've got quite a lot of work going on into health inequalities for people with dementia, for example, young and late onset dementia. We do have recently quite a lot of work that's emerged in our international sphere, for example, with Colombia, Uganda and India. And as you may be aware, there's been a bit of an announcement from the government. We won't go into that too much, but let's just say international research budget funding has been cut. So that means some of our work is being affected, unfortunately. Um, we also have a study that was introduced by Kimberly last time on a systematic review and a um, small study into promoting oral care and care home residents. Um, yeah, and that's a bit of an overview. And the next slide, please, Pallavi. So in the cross-generational, without me reading all of this from the slides, um, we've got a large uh, number of things going on as well. Uh, some of it is COVID research. So Mark uh, discussed some of his Area B work, for example, at one of those previous meetings. Um, we have the COVID Live cohort study where we're trying to understand the psychological and social impact of the pandemic and as said it's not just about older adults or uh, working age adults but really across the spectrum cross-generational um, and you can see a few more of those um, research projects going on there. If you could move to the next slide please Pallavi, thank you. Um, and under marginalized groups, we have um, one study looking at making participation in cancer research more accessible. And we also have a study which was uh, mentioned in previous team meetings, I think, on British Muslims' experiences and perceptions of social distancing during the COVID pandemic. And I think we have Dr. Shema Hassan joining us to give a little bit of a snapshot of this study as she was leading on this. Okay. Thank you, Clarissa. Yes, uh, sorry, just before you get to that, Shema, I just want to just pick up a few things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clarissa. Just to explain why we've done this sub themes, it, the life course is a, is a huge area to think about, and we thought this would help people um, organize their thinking into different sub themes ar uh, around the ages of man, I guess, which is why we've done it in that way with the two extra uh, ideas about the marginalized groups and the cross generational. It just maybe gives people a, a more manageable way of structuring all the different things that we're doing. 
Uh, I just want to very briefly highlight one thing I'm particularly proud of in the area B work that Clarissa mentioned, which uh, is great to have Shema on because she's had a lot to help uh, with us to help us do that, uh, as has Catherine Aber and one or two other colleagues, is that I think one of a big innovation that, we, that we're going to be writing up because we think it is fairly, um, again, innovative in that we're working with the public in that project uh, on our data sets. And we're working in a way that doesn't usually happen to the extent that they're involved because we are putting our money where our mouth is as an arc. So our members of the public involved in that project are actively co-researching on that with us. They have just as much input into the way that we look at those data and we analyze it and produce the thematic uh, analysis, as we call it. So we look at all the interviews and all the different things that have come into us as a project team. And they are equal members of the team looking at those uh, data sets and coding them and coming up with the ideas. And we're particularly proud of that because normally what people do is the researchers go away and do it and then present it back to a meeting. But we've said that's not good enough for the ARC. We actually want them to be involved throughout the process. And it's worked really well and it really has helped demonstrate the added benefits you get when you widen who it is that's working on your research with you and the sorts of ideas that are generated. So sorry for that quick aside and a bit of an advert for what we're doing. Uh, Shema. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thanks, Larissa. Yes. So talking about the Muslim study, what we found during COVID is, <clears throat> sorry, the impact of COVID across the UK has highlighted the continuous health inequalities experienced by different communities, and especially people from ethnic minority backgrounds. So what we decided to do is actually look at the Muslim community within the Northwest Coast, which is considered as the second largest religious group. This group within itself is a community within communities. Um, there are different ethnic backgrounds, different languages. So we wanted to explore what are some of the impact factors that COVID has within their experiences of social um, distancing and social isolation. So we had a series of qualitative interviews and focus groups with members of the public. And, and what we found is basically, um, um, the, what we found is the religious teaching was identified in the study as um, playing an important role um, in um, sequentially re reinforcing the hygiene and the social distancing guidelines within the community. The closure of the local mosque during the, the COVID pandemic um, sent a really strong message across the, um, across the community, which um, enabled the community to realize the seriousness of the virus um, and, and, to, and, and be able to kind of adhere to the um, measures or government guidelines. Um, but what we also found is that these resources such as the mosque was the support mechanism for the community. And by closing down the mosque, people were missing out on um, receiving the support that they needed. Um, so what we found in, a, what we highlight in the study is about improving community communications between local leaders and provision of information um, that needs to be enhanced to an odd support and members of the Muslim community um, understand the seriousness of COVID. So what we did following the, the study, when we um, collected the data and analyzed the data, we actually say, shared our um, findings and learning with um, the center, um, cent, cent, sorry, it's, um, Central Liverpool Primary Care Networks. And what we did, we got involved with a community conversation to talk about the uptake of a COVID vaccination. Following that, we worked together with the uh, Liverpool Primary Care Network to um, organize um, some pop-up clinics um, within the local mosque. There was two up to now, and we had a good turnout from the Muslim community coming up to, um, to do that. Well, uh, we are in anticipating to continue um, and doing a follow-up interviews a year on following the first um, COVID um, lockdown um, to explore the experiences of the Muslim community and exploring the recovery following COVID and their perceptions and risk of long-term COVID. And that's where we are at the moment. Oops. Thank you very much, Shema. So, Pallavi, where are we coming up to next? We're going to move into presentations um, and presentations by Dorcas and Paul now. That's correct. So thank you yes. very much. So we're now going to hear from our public advisors and then we're going to hear about some projects and our PhD project as well. And then we'll go on to do some voting. So there'll now be a series of recordings. Good morning, everybody. And 
it is a privilege to be here this morning to talk to you about us new members of the team, myself and Paul. Thanks to Mark and, and his team for giving us this opportunity and uh, especially to Pallavi for supporting us a lot. Can I have the first PowerPoint, please? Local environmental protection, public health. And health. My name is Dorcas. Uh, I'm just going to talk, talk to you about my journey. How oh, volunteering has made a lot of difference to me. Next. Next. <laughs> ah, here we are. Thank you so much. Um, I'm originally from Nigeria and I came to Liverpool in 1974 uh, on a very, very winter day and very snow on the floor, which I've never seen before. Um, I did my nursing in Nigeria with uh, good commendations. Uh, and I did uh, a midwifery training in Nigeria with distinctions. But unfortunately, we, uh, my midwifery was not recognized here. So I have to do a whole year again. Isn't that interesting? But that's what I am. I wanted to be a midwife. And I did my first degree in John Moss at the age of 55, and uh, then went to do my master's at the age of uh, 65. So nobody is ever too old to learn. You can see my picture there as the president of Soroptomis and my little, uh, my honor from the queen on the left-hand side. The next slide, please. Um, getting the uh, uh, order of British Empire was a great honor to me. And, and I didn't set off to get this as a midwife. I just love my job and I'm just volunteer. And uh, it was just an honor. And when you get it, you didn't, think you're going to get it, but you need a lot of citations before you get it. Having lifetime achievement is not about me alone, really. It's about what I've done for the college and as a black woman. And the Omolu Abbey achievement one is about the community recognizing the volunteering I do. Next slide, please. I work at the Liverpool Maternity for about so many years, and I haven't got much time to tell you much about myself, but uh, you can see on the slide, I used to rotate and I was a team leader at implementing changing childbirth. Changing childbirth is about one-to-one -one midwifery. But I have a great interest in female genital mutilation. Somebody, some people will call it female circumcision, but the most important thing for me is to support the women. Set up the multicultural women and I was helping a lot of women in the local area, so that the been women doing a lot of F, um, uh, if, uh, if matters and uh, setting up schemes. Then I set up the link clinic and that's a good one because the clinic is still running, supporting women whose language is not, uh, is not English. And then I, I got involved with the quality and diversity. Hemoglobinopathies is about sickle cell, about thalassemia uh, and support women about that as well. And I was a supervisor of midwives which is very, very good, making sure their practice is up to scratch. Next slide, please. Volunteering, when you volunteer, you don't think about it. You just want to support and help people. Being on the college, it gives me opportunity to work around the midwives as well. The African elders, I felt that a lot of African uh, older people, they don't like the English food. So we set up uh, a, a lunch club and I used to do the, I was the cook and the secretary for 20 years. A school governor and, and governor for the Roya is a good opportunity for me as well. I learn a lot as a governor at the, at the Roya uh, Liverpool University in Hospital. An active member of Soroptomis and that's why I became a president about a few years ago. And I'm now the regional president for Lan Lancashire. Um, it's about supporting women and girls in relation to educate, education, empowerment, and initiating them to do better for themselves. Um, I set up the Breathe Easy Foundation in memory of my daughter, who, is, um, who died in Nigeria of asthma. Um, next slide, please. This is my daughter. She did a master, she did a degree in media, and she was working at uh, um, with with MTV when she died. The Breathe Easy, we support people with chronic asthma. Next slide, please. Um, I joined the Clark in 2015 because uh, what, how we join it is about us 
you know, when we did a, a, a scheme at Liverpool, looking at people that are not having bowel cancer uh, screening. And that's how we became PA, which I joined the, the, the club. I was subcommittee there. I did a lot of training, uh, speaking about Clark, and I was involved with the CCG, and I'm still in the communication group. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to hand over to Paul now, who is my deputy co lead and later on we will have an interactive session. Thanks, Dorcas. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Paul Moran. I don't know how I'm going to follow Dorcas there. Anybody knows knows how kind of amazing woman she is, uh, but I'll I'll give it my best. Um, so yeah, my name's Paul Moran. I'm a public advisor from Old Swan in Liverpool. Married to Maxime, my long suffering wife, um, and I'm a father to uh, 11 year old Joseph, who's in his first year of seniors, and a very keen footballer, um, and five year old Olivia, who's in year one, and an absolute diva. If Palavi wants to just move on to the next slide, I'm sure you'll see a picture of them. Uh, I live, work and run a boxing club in Old Swan. Uh, I'm very invested in the future prosperity of Old Swan and the area and, and the people within it. Um, I work together with a number of kind of, you know, different age groups throughout um, throughout the area. And obviously, you know, I'm very, uh, very keen to kind of um, improve the, the, the outcomes of uh, Old Swan as, in any possible way I can. Uh, I've been a public advisor for probably the last six months or so, uh, and I've recently been accepted to uh, be a co-lead for the Health and Care Across the Life course theme with Dorcas. Uh, I was originally signposted to the role through um, some work that I did on a project called Better Old Swan, uh, which looked to generate improvements in my local area, my local community, and especially focused on monitoring with the view to improve air quality, which is a big issue in Old Swan. I've really enjoyed getting to know the team, understanding a little bit more about research uh, and contributing my opinion to a number of diverse studies, which I, I would have never thought kind of, you know, I, I could contribute to. Uh, next slide, please, Pallavi. And probably next slide again as well, please. Um, so. In my spare time, I do, I do help to run uh, Old Swan Amateur Boxing Club, as I said. Uh, I'm very invested in providing opportunities for young people, not only to kind of learn the art of amateur boxing, but also to improve the physical and mental well-being through sport. Uh, I know how important sport is um, to both mental and physical health, um, and I know that kind of they the, the complement each other greatly. Uh, and some of the journeys that some of the children in the boxing gym have been through since, you know, uh, really shrinking violets coming into the gym to what, the, what they're producing as young men now, it's just incredible. Uh, in normal circumstances, I do travel the country with these young people and see the pride they take in representing not only our club and, and this city, um, but also themselves and, the, and their parents as well. And the confidence that they take into other parts of their lives, whether they win, whether they learn or whether they draw in that, in that contest, um, is, is, is kind of key for everyone to see. You'll see there a, a picture of young Caden who's been in the gym since he was seven um, and is now kind of a 12 year old uh, becoming a man. Uh, I'm also flicking onto the next picture again, Pallavi. I'm also an ambassador for Liverpool City Council's Fit For Me campaign, which aims to get people of all ages into different activities. The campaign uses real people from the community to tell their stories of how they've become active and how, how that has improved their lives. Uh, the campaign showcases a, a number of different types of activity you can get involved in, no matter your age, your ability or your financial position, as it's all about finding the right fit for you. Over the years, I've completed a number of challenges, including walking up Kilimanjaro, completing three marathons, uh, the three peaks in 24 hours. And definitely my biggest achievement was learning to swim over 40 years of age, which was something I never actually thought I'd do. So really pleased with that. Um, lastly, just, just to kind of to finish off, I, I think looking at looking at the theme that I'm on, and um, also some other skills I can bring, I, I do look after my, my, my elderly mother at the moment as well. And also my sister who's a number of kind of debilitating and mental health problems over the last few years. I'm hoping these kind of this knowledge, this experience, will help me to contribute when needed and um, through different projects within within the theme. And I, I'm really looking forward to growing as a public advisor and playing my part in, in making people's lives better. 
Thank you. You you say you can follow me. You're doing a lot. I uh, I'm uh, I, I, that's brilliant. And what you bring into the team is very good. Uh, can I, you said um, you've already mentioned when you bring into the team. Since you've joined us, could you tell me how you feel about the PAs and what you think we could be doing better? Uh, thanks, Lucas. Yeah, I, th I think, um, I, as I said, we've only been here a couple of months, but I think we've got a really strong team. We're, with such a diverse background of kind of skills and knowledge that, mm. you know, I think we, we've got kind of most subjects that are going to come up covered in, in some way. Uh, I think it's always vital to get different opinions from different groups, whether that's ages um, or, or, or whatever that different group is right across the board. So, and I think we've got that covered. Um, I think it, as, as far as uh, kind of, I think, um, I think I think personally I can bring quite quite a lot of different experiences to the team and I'm really looking forward to kind of you know working with a number of the public advisors right across not just our theme but right across the uh, the public advisor group and um, to, to again make lives better. I, I think we are more or less so, was like... just one thing go on. go on Paul. Yeah what one thing I was just one thing I just wanted to, to pull out from your kind of presentation there you, you, you touched on kind of the charity um, that, that you set up um, on behalf of your daughter. Can you tell us about kind of how that came about a little bit and um, you know, do you think that will help you in your kind of view as a public advisor? Yes, forward? because um, my daughter was asthmatic and, uh, and I'm asthmatic and I've got comorbidity as well. I am disabled. Uh, I couldn't put all my pictures on because I've lost uh, about four children. So I've got a bit of depression. My daughter died in Nigeria of asthmatic. There was no oxygen, no nebulizer. They could not help her. And that is why, rather than for me and my husband trying to think about her all the time, we set that charity off in our memory. And what we do is that we raise funds and uh, we buy nebulizer. I've got lots of pictures and I've put the website on because I haven't got much time to tell people about it. The website is on the slides. People can go and look. We take nebulizers and pig flows to Nigeria and we distribute to those who cannot pay. You know, in Africa, there is no free, no free medication, no free uh, care. You have to buy, you have to pay. And if you don't have money, unfortunately, you know, that's it. So that's why we thought we do something positive about Lara. Uh, she's called Lara. She's gorgeous. I miss her. And that's why I said that wrong. Um, and it's helping me in mm -hmm. a way because I've, that's why I do a lot of volunteering because I can't stay still. Uh, it makes me to focus. It makes me to go out. It makes me to meet even with the team. I said the PAs for fifth, uh, six years we've been together. I've met a lot of them and with the diversity in us and the skills, and that's good. And it will help me as well to understand how our team will work. Because although as an NHS employee that I've been in NHS and I'm married, and I say midwife, and our team is from birth, from pregnancy to end of life. And I think I fell into that category. I am disabled, I have got blood pressure, I've got everything you can think of, but I don't let it get me down. I want to be involved. And I'm, I'm sure as you said, you said, bringing our own personal experience, we help us, our commitment, we help us because both of us are very committed and we believe in co-production and I believe in collaboration. And this is why I was volunteering. I bring people together. I, I don't like to say, uh, this group, uh, and I like intergeneration. I can't do your boxing though, but I like the, the, to be involved in your children, you know, and that is great. And I think for us, we will bring a lot to the team. And we just want to make a point that, you know, for those listening really, we are volunteers as we are, but we are ready to do what we can to make a difference. Thank you.
I, I don't agree with you there, Dorcas, about it not being able to do the boxing. I think you could definitely do the boxing if you could put your mind to it. But um, what I'll do is I'll hand you back over to Palavi now so she can kind of go on to Thank the next you slide. So much. God very bless much, everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to us. If you have any questions, you can ask us later. Welcome, everyone. My name is Rujan Nabalog. I'm a PhD student at Lancaster University in the Division of Health Research. In the next few minutes, I would like to introduce myself and my PhD project, The Impact of Physical Activity Interventions on Bereaved Older People, Carers and Non-Carers in Penai, Lancashire. I am from Hungary. My educational background includes a master's degree in clinical and health psychology from University of Szeged and a master's degree in sport and exercise psychology from Roehampton University. In the past two years, I worked as a psychologist in a health promotion office. I mainly worked with older people and my duties involved counseling, organizing mental health related events and self-help groups. In addition, I was working as an assistant lecturer at the University of Szeged, Faculty of Health Sciences and Social Studies, where I ran half promotion, half education and developmental psychology lectures and seminars. My research project examines the impact of physical activity interventions on psychological and physical resilience of carers and non-carers aged 55 plus who have experienced bereavement in the past 6 to 12 months. The research hypothesizes that physical activity can reduce the negative impact of bereavement in older age. The research will be linked to Together an Active Future program. To examine the participants' relationships with physical activity, a qualitative life course interview approach will be used. To assess the impact of the physical activity intervention on mental and physical health related variables, a pre and post intervention quantitative study will be used. As I started my PhD studies in February, the current stage of this project is the planning process of literature review and ethical application. The research can help to improve health and social care by determining the potential impact of physical activity on the negative consequences of bereavement, developing physical activity intervention and demonstrating positive impact on health. The research also aims to explore the impact of the project on health inequalities. The wider effects of the research are to make significant contribution to the literature on bereavement support, to have impact on health and healthcare use, and to highlight possible ways of intervention. Working in the art provides a special opportunity to take part in applied health research with a real impact. With public and community involvement, researches and implementations are relevant to the needs of the patients and the public. Based on my work experience in health promotion, it is crucial to produce evidence-based implementation, which is suitable and relevant to the community and the patient's needs. I think ARC provides a unique opportunity for me to be part of and work in a research community, which produces applied health research that aims for health equality. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Kim Ward and I'm Dementia Project Coordinator at The Brain Charity. We initially started working with Liverpool Uni's Health and Care Across the Life course in partnership with Dr Clarissa Gibral to support the evaluations of our music-based therapy sessions. Working together, we were looking at the benefits of the Music Makes Us sessions, which combine physiotherapy with dance and speech and language therapy with singing. After going into lockdown, the Brain Charity pivoted to provide emergency food relief for our service users who are shielding. And Dr Giebel invited us to be part of a body of research into the effects of COVID and a reduction in services, such as our workshops on people living with dementia. It also became clear over the past year that the surge in new communication technologies were leaving some people with this condition behind. And the Dementia Forum and Workshop last October was really helpful in that we were able to share some information and advice with other dementia-specific service providers. And combined with what our service users were telling us, then we turned our workshops into an easy-to-access video series, which went live at the beginning of March. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Hall, Bridgewater Community Healthcare's Head of Research. So here at Bridgewater, we span a wide geography covering Greater Manchester, Cheshire and Merseyside. 
working with patients right across their life course, so literally from the moment they're born right until their end of life. So we have a diverse patient population, working with them predominantly in the homes, but also in a wide range of community settings. So we're relatively new members to the ARC. We joined back in um, at the end of last year. We've already been working with the theme to see how we can support some of your projects. So we've been looking at how we can get involved in the community health care worker project and also how we can use our extensive dental network and provision to support the mouth care matters evaluation. So I think it's fair to say that we've got a very modest research infrastructure here at Bridgewater, but we certainly make up for this with our ambition and our curiosity. So we're looking forward to being able to work with the ARC and the theme to build up research capacity, access to training and, and research skills for our staff. I think we can also, as I've mentioned, bring with us a diverse patient population as well. And we're looking forward to building on our integrated care partnerships that we've already started to build with our acute partners, our primary care partners and social care as well. So I'm really looking forward to working with you here at the ARC and the theme and hopefully we'll get to meet up soon. Good morning everyone, my name is Rosie. I am the founder of the Meet a Youth Centre. We are a day centre for people living with dementia. My passion for dementia has exposed me to some fantastic possibilities. One, becoming a member of the ARC. I have thoroughly enjoyed being part of the health and care across the life course, as this has presented me with opportunity to work, liaise and network with researchers, other care providers and more people with lived experience of dementia. I am very grateful. Hi, my name is Mariana Popa. I'm a research assistant in the Department of Public Health and Policy Systems at the University of Liverpool. And I'm here today to talk about the COACT study, which is led by Dr. Fran Sherratt. Um, the aim of the study is to look at how we can make research, cancer research, more accessible to patients from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds by optimizing trial communication. Some of the problems we've identified uh, when it comes to cancer trials is difficulty with recruitment, which may result in costly extensions and closures. And if we consider, if we want to understand how important this is, we can consider the development of the COVID vaccine. So one of the things that this process underlined was the importance of volunteers in clinical trials. Um, because faster accrual allows trials to be conducted more quickly and therefore determine treatment efficacy more quickly as well. Um, moreover, um, trials under recruit patients from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, um, which means that trial results um, um, may not be um, um, cannot be generalized to the wider population. They are not representative of the wider uh, population or may not transfer to real world settings. And finally, trial participants have better outcomes. Um, and this is regardless of whether they've been allocated to the treatment arm or placebo. And the problem with this is considering everything we've just discussed, um, there is an inequity of access to effective treatments. So some people do not have access to um, effective treatments because of this. Um, this takes us to the aim of the project. Um, we are going to look at um, the differences um, and similarities in how practitioners communicate about trials with patients from the most socioeconomically disadvantaged groups compared to patients from the least disadvantaged groups. And how are we going to do this? We will um, conduct a secondary analysis of qualitative data. We have a pool of over 90 trial consultation recordings from three different cancer-related trials. Um, in these consultations, health professionals invite patients to take part in clinical trials. 
we will look at uh, patient demographics uh, and determine um, a, those from most to least disadvantaged areas. Um, this is based on postcode. And we will try to discover how um, doctors explain clinical trials to patients from different backgrounds um, by comparing these two groups. Uh, here's a brief timeline um, of the project. We are in the process of preparing the data um, to start the analysis. And we're also planning on um, conducting a patient and public involvement meeting. Um, and we recognize that people with lived experiences can contribute massively to research and can um, provide researchers with valuable insight, which is why it was very important for us to, uh, to engage with members of the patient and public involvement group um, as partners to improve the integrity of our study. And um, you will also, like, if you have any suggestions um, for public engagement, like any activities or how it's best to engage, uh, do feel free to uh, email us. <laughs> we would really, we're really open to any suggestions, feedback. And then towards the end of the summer, we'll be looking at um, disseminating our findings and writing like end of project reports, um, and this study is part of a larger NIHR application, so we'll be develop developing that as well. And um, like I said, we plan on uh, running a public engagement event. So if you have any suggestions on how we can engage with the public, um, we would really appreciate any feedback. Um, however, um, there may be some COVID restrictions that we'll need to keep in mind. Um, so we'll have to have a think about how we're going to go about uh, running this event. And in terms of um, impact, um, we are hoping that this study will inform strategies to enhance recruitment for patients from socioeconomically disadvantaged groups. And we hope that um, patients will feel more um, empowered and supported to make more informed decisions about their treatment and care. And we hope that we can um, find uh, ways to increase patient access to potentially superior investigational treatments. Like you said in the beginning, um, people who take part in um, uh, trials do have better outcomes. So we hope that trials reflect the diversity of patients more accurately <laughs> and um, it can improve how doctors explain clinical trials. Um, to patients from different socioeconomic backgrounds um, and basically make research more inclusive. So thank you. I've added um, our contact details on this final slide. So do uh, feel free to get in touch if you have any suggestions or feedback. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me again. Um, I'm Joe Rylands, I'm an academic uh, training GP at Liverpool and I, I'm here to talk about uh, some research that I'm planning to do um, which I'll be very grateful if it will be adopted onto the ARC uh, to help with um, to help with my recruitment and hopefully I can provide some useful information um, for the team. Uh, so I'm planning to uh, do some qualitative uh, research so interviewing people uh, who work in social prescribing schemes in, in the Northwest um, and exploring how they view health inequalities. Um, so health inequalities are talked a lot um, about, we've talked about a lot, um, but they are the unjust discrepancy um, in health outcomes uh, on the basis of social determinants of health. It could be anything from gender to income to ethnicity. Um, and they account for millions of lost years of life and even more years of, uh, uh, of higher levels of disability in, in people who, who are more deprived. Um, they are also getting worse um, and measures that have been taken um, by the UK government and wider uh, governments in, in the global north um, have not been particularly effective. Um, and part of the reason, one of the main reasons that uh, is cited in, in literature 
uh, for, for this is that there's been a huge focus on individual life factors. So essentially telling people who are living with deprivation that they should do better, that they should be healthier. So uh, I've included the Whitehead and Dal Green uh, model, which I'm sure some of you are very familiar with. And um, But in the middle, you've got the individual factors, so things that people can do. And then going out, we've got the wider and wider so, uh, social determinants, so it includes uh, community values, um, and then going up to the structural uh, aspects around policy, employment, and um, and wider things that traditionally the what the government has uh, control over. And so social prescribing is this being proposed amongst many things it's been proposed for, but it's been, uh, to reduce health inequalities. The idea proposed by the government and also supported by people like Michael Marmot, um, who are a very big deal in health inequalities, is that by social prescribing schemes linking to community uh, at large and community services, um, it will in, it will encourage more resilience. It will encourage more integration of care, and that will in turn help health inequalities. Um, however, there's not a huge amount of evidence so far to suggest that that is happening, and it's more proposed as a theoretical basis. Um, so. And what I'm going to look at is what we call social con construction of health inequalities. So this is not just the statistics of health inequalities, but how people view it. Um, and that can have a very real impact on uh, on people's day to day life and what happens. So I've included this uh, little um, quote from Lao Tzu about how thoughts become words and words become actions and actions become a habit. I think that's a really good way of work of kind of thinking through how uh, how our thoughts about health inequalities and poverty can impact on uh, on how we act. Um, there's been lots of research done into how clinicians, particularly GPs, view health inequalities, um, and it shows that that has an impact on on their care and the decisions that they make. However, there's been no research into what people who work in social prescribing schemes, um, how they view health inequalities. And if they're being charged to deliver improvements in health inequalities, then it's really important to know how they view them um, and whether that has an impact on their on their work. And I think that's particularly important in terms of whether it whether social prescribing is going to act on individual on the individual or whether it's going to act on the wider community. And um, because within the models of social prescribing, which the, there are many and they're very varied, um, but that could easily still focus very much on individual responsibility and telling people helping people to make those health changes rather than helping people to look at the broader picture of poverty and deprivation and cultural aspects of of, of that um, and there's some uh, research done on the life rooms in Liverpool uh, by our own team um, which which does so show some positive uh, signs in terms of people who are interviewed who are using the service viewed uh, the life rooms as a as a community space it was somewhere that they could go and that very much does fit with marmots and the government's model of how social uh, prescribing could reduce health inequalities and um, so what i'm planning to do um, is to do some research interview about 10 to 15 people who work in a variety of different social prescribing schemes in the northwest um, uh, i would very much like to use arc to do that recruitment uh, and then once i've got the once I've done the interviews, use thematic analysis um, and also use something called the Bradalotto framework, um, which I've done a very crude uh, version of down below, um, which kind of groups people into whether they view it as a health inequalities as a as a functional aspect, which is kind of the individualized um, proce processes, analytical, which is like the community aspects, uh, and structural, uh, which is the wider policy determinants. Um, and then I'm going to use that research as part of my master's dissertation presents um, what I find back to yourselves. And if I do a good enough job, um, publish it as an academic, an academic journal. OK, um, and I've included uh, my references here. All right. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Those are excellent presentations. Um, we're going to go into some voting now. Mark's talked about voting earlier, so we're going to be voting. Um, and we're basically voting um, for uh, Joe's project based on what you've just heard. Um, could we please have the polls up? So the first question with relation to Joe's project would, how would you prioritize this 
outline proposal for ARC, high, medium, low, or you say it's not a priority. Please vote now, I'll give you a few seconds. If for any reason you cannot vote, please uh, put in your um, answers in the chat box and, and I'll consider them later. Okay, so could we have the results of that vote, please? I think people may have had a chance to do it now. Okay, so we've got about 62% who considered high um, and 38% considered medium. That's that's good news, Joe. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, could we go to the next question, please? So, uh, would you or your organization be interested in participating in this project? Yes or no? Okay, please, can you put the um, results of that? Great, we've got we've got quite a few who said yes, about 67% who said yes. Fantastic. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get your details and pass them on to Joe if you're happy for me to do so. If not, just let me know. You can send me an email. Um, we'll be moving on to our final presentation for this session, and that's Dr. Pooja Saini. Hi, I've been asked to come and speak to you um, about some of the work that I'm involved in. So I'm Dr. Pooja Saini. Um, I work at Liverpool John Moores University as a reader in suicide and self-harm prevention. So the research I'm here to discuss today is looking at new care pathways for the management of self-harm in schools. So why is this? As we know, the prevalence of self-harm has increased over the last decade um, in young people and the burden on health services is continuing to increase. This is uh, resulting in additional um, financial implications for the NHS and further cost implications as well. And what this work will hopefully do is look at improving the identification and treatment of self-harm whilst reducing emergency admissions and length of inpatient stay. And that has been highlighted as one of the priorities for the NHS in its five year forward view. So there's an urgent need to look at the evidence of effective intervention. So I'm going to discuss now just what the research is saying about um, some of the reviews that have been conducted. So we know that self-harm um, among young people is a major public health problem. And even though schools are placed in the community, they're a place where self-harm might be identified, where interventions might be able to take place. We know that schools um, staff are lacking training and confidence in the management of young people who may be self-harming. We're not sure what the reasons for that are, um, but that's something we'd like to learn more about. Now, a recent systematic review um, by PRA and colleagues indicates that more evidence is needed to determine the effectiveness, acceptability and feasibility of interventions for school staff addressing self-harm. Uh, we're also conducting a review to have a look at what interventions have already been implemented in schools across the country and across the world so that we can have a look at maybe some lessons that can be learned from interventions that have shown to be successful. Um, we also need to do some more studies to really understand how interventions work in different staff cohorts and across different schools and also look at the outcomes for the actual students and young people. So currently the pathways include uh, young people may disclose um, and communicate self-harm at school. They may also disclose at home or with friends and schools may be informed, families may be informed. So once that happens, we want to understand what the process is, where might the young people be referred from some preliminary conversations or from some uh, boards that I'm involved in, we're aware that some schools will have safeguarding staff or nurses and young people may be sent to them. Some schools have access to YPASS 
um, who provide counselling or other therapies for young people um, that may be useful for young people who may be self-harming. And there can also be referrals to seedlings, which is for younger people who are primary school age. And as we know, self-harm is increasing in younger people who are primary school age as well. Um, additionally, schools are usually um, encouraging parents to go to their GP um, and speak to their GP about the young person who's self-harming as well. So what might happen then? A young person may be admitted to hospital. They may be referred to um, secondary mental health care um, for psychotherapy to CAMS. But as many of you are probably aware, there's a very long waiting list for CAMS. Um, they may be referred back to their GP um, and managed there while they're on a waiting list, or they may not be seen to meet the criteria to go on a waiting list. So there's quite different outcomes that may happen um, for young people currently. So what do we want to do? We want to have a look at, well, we're currently auditing hospital data with Alder Hay, and we want to know which young people are attending for self-harm. Where should the interventions be placed? Um, you know, where's the highest need? Also, we want to look at the pathways of care following their attendance in A&E to get a further understanding of how it's dealt with once people, uh, young people have attended um, at A&E for self-harm. We also want to evaluate a school self-harm toolkit, which is going to be implemented across Cheshire and Merseyside, um, where training is going to be provided as well to staff on the use of this toolkit. Um, and we want to understand, you know, how people have found it, has it been used well, um, and are any changes required to it. We also want to review what is and isn't working well in schools currently for the management of self-harm so that we can build on that. We want to consult with young people, carers and schools on the needs for young people who self-harm. And finally, we want to develop an evidence-based, school-based self-harm intervention to reduce the number of hospital admissions amongst young people for self-harm in the long term, as we know that that will lead to better health outcomes for them as well. So finally, there's going to be two poll questions that you're presented with of, do you think this work is a priority and would you or your organisation like to be involved in this work? Contact details as well, if any of you would like to get in touch after this um, presentation. Thank you. Great. So um, again, we're going to be doing some voting for this particular project. So could we please have the first um, polling up there? So exactly the same questions um, as previously. Uh, how would you prioritize this outline proposal for ARC? High, medium, low, or not a priority? Okay, can we move on to the results, please? So we've got about 78% high, 20% medium, and 3% low. Uh, could we move on to the next question? So again, the next question is, would you or your organization be interested in participating in this project? Yes or no? Okay, we can move on to the um, results. So 56% yes and 44% uh, no. Um, so again, I will be, will be handing over um, your details to Pooja if you're interested. Uh, over to you, Mark. We just have two minutes left, um, but we could go a few minutes over if you have more to say. No, I don't have more to say. It's open now to colleagues um, to, to comment on what they've heard and ask any questions. I think it's been a really fascinating session. I hope you agree. Anybody want to say anything? Raise your hand or just speak on mute. Um, if no one no, else, I just wanted to add one bit at the end. I think um, I'm very keen to participate with as many 
people as possible, but uh, I'm slightly restricted by master's um, restrictions. But anyone who's uh, interested, I will uh, still respond and see if we can sort something out. Yeah, don't forget, it, it, it might be partly to do with your master's, but there may also be other data subsequently that you may want to look at with others uh, uh, following on from the initial project. So it's about keeping that link. To yeah, very much I so. I you're going to blast us a song there with your guitar ready to pluck. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. I don't, think want, I don't think you'd want to hear my voice. It's not a good voice, bad voice on ITV or whatever, is it? Right. Uh, any um, any more comments from anybody? We stunned you into silence, which I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but thanks very much. Um, got a break now, and we're coming back together in half an hour's time. So I'm not going to prolong it because I'm sure you've got plenty to do between now and one thirty when we'll meet again. Cheers, everybody. Bye.